so it's midday and uh, another day in the Kepler ISA event and um, today I'm really pleased that we've got um, Stephen Lilly from UK Wind joining us. Um, UK, Wind, UK Wind sits in a sector that sometimes can be a bit complicated and certainly has its <coughs> share of jargon. But I think it's fair to say that UK Wind is a, an oasis of simplicity within that, with a very straightforward business model that's quite easy to understand, um, and a very long track record of delivering on on some very clear objectives. And and just to pick one number to give you a, a, a kind of sense of the importance UK Wind has to the UK economy, it generates enough electricity to power two and a half million homes. But with the the trust on a now on a 15% discount, I think it's a really good time to take another, another look at this FTSE 250 trust. And, and in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Stephen, who's going to do, do just that with you. Um, just very briefly, um, housekeeping. Um, Stephen will talk for perhaps 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, there's time for Q&A afterwards. Do type your questions in the Q&A box. We'll be monitoring those whilst Stephen is talking. Um, if you have any technical issues, just put that in the Q&A box as well, and someone will try and take a look at those. Um, but with that said, um, I'll hand over to Stephen. Alan, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I guess, just about. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, you, you mentioned on uh, that we're a uh, FTSE 250 company. We have been on the verge of the FTSE 100 for about uh, two years now, um, which has been, in, in one sense, slightly irritating because the ability for us to be able to um, grow in the future is, is absolutely enormous, as, as the uh, especially offshore wind build out over the next 10 years uh, continues uh, at a great speed, and, and our ability as a a key a key component of that market um, sh should enable us to grow quite substantially going forward. Um, the reason, obviously, we haven't grown is is not because of opportunity of of buying; it's because of where we've been trading, and we'll come uh, and, and come onto that uh, in, in a few slides' time. So, let's sort of go on quickly. This is obviously an ISA series. Um, income is a big thing for us. Um, uh, we pay a ten p dividend, um, and and uh, we'll sort of go through a little bit about what that really means. This before we get onto it is. Uh, Bibber Bank extension, um, that's the Lancashire coast. If you can look in, uh, uh, get your magnifying glass and look into the distance. Um, so this is sort of approaching from North Wales over to Liverpool's on the right um, and Lancashire in front of you. Um, if you carry on, uh, let me turn pages. So next page. So we're meant to be, and I think hopefully we are simple, low risk, transparent. We're not trying to um, shoot the lights out on return by taking ridiculous risks. We're trying to be really straightforward. You know, we'll, production volatility is low. Um, we, we produce what we say we're going to do over, the, over an extended period. It might, might be uh, more or less windy on any particular day, but over the extended period it isn't. It's just very standard. Uh, we get paid uh, uh, a high uh, EBITDA margin. But let's sort of work through that as we go forward. So simple, we aim to produce a dividend that increases with RPI every year. We've done that 11 times now, apart from Last year, when we increased by 14.2% um, and not the 5.2% of December's RPI. So we've at least increased with RPI every single year since listing. That's 11 times. Um, we're a UK domicile business, but we're based in the UK. We're domiciled in the UK. It gives us great uh, exposure and great, great advantage to a very strong independent board um, or UK domiciled. Um, we're meant to be pretty straightforward by operating, risk, uh, operating assets. We have low gearing. Very high cash flow stability and massive uh, massive tolerance to sensitivity, especially, especially the power price. And in fact, um, we have huge tolerance, if you like, as you'll see as we go through this, for low for when power prices uh, uh, decrease, but 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 big 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 advantage on the upside. So when 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 uh, uh, in 2023 when power prices were very high, 22 23, um, we got paid very well for the uh, production. Um, in, in those years, because we're you know we're we're we're, we're exposed to the upside, and, and are protected on the downside. So eleven years on, dividend started at six pence. Um, it's increased by RPA every single year. 
uh, 10 pence for 2024, uh, and at the same time as producing a dividend that always increases with, with RPI. Um, we, we preserve NAV on, on a real basis because we have a lot more cash flow than just the dividend. And, <clears throat> and I suppose the most important thing is that the return on this business, um, uh, net of fees, 10% uh, return um, if you bought the shares at NAV, obviously below that, probably a 12% return um, uh, a dividend and, and, and capital growth. So NAV's growing to 64% versus RPI, RPI compounding of 52. So hopefully pretty straightforward, uh, simple, low risk, transparent business. Um, carrying on through, uh, we have Fortnite Wind Farms. You can see that on this map on the right hand side. Um, you can see all those. I won't read these. You know, CO two avoided. That's obviously a key theme. Our, our, our run rate at the moment is two and a half million tons um, per year avoided. Uh, obviously, you'd have to put gas on if we weren't producing wind power, and that would obviously burn carbon dioxide. Um, we've generated a lot of cash in that period. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that up on the next slide. We paid over a billion pounds worth of dividends now in eleven years. Um, and, and we've 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 uh, uh, reinvested a lot of excess cash generation. Market cap market cap has grown to um, uh, 3.3 billion. It's been a bit higher in the past. Um, we operate seven percent of operating UK wind farms, um, and the UK wind wind farm uh, uh, capacity should um, double onshore, triple offshore, and 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 the value over the next 10 years probably should go from 100 to a 200 billion pound market. So massive opportunity for us. Um, and we're a big part of that already. Um, if you carry on down, just I want to get through some very quick um, uh, economics, if you can sort of see, so you can see how this all works. So we own wind farms on someone else's land. So that's a square field in this example. The turbines are ours. Um, we have a substations um, where we where we do all sorts of conversion and switching. That goes onto uh, onto meter onto the grid. So whatever we produce gets dispatched onto the network. Uh, and into people's homes, we pay a fixed percentage of our revenue to the landowners for that for life. So very straightforward. Um, uh, EBITDA margin is extremely high, so you can sort of see this. Just this is this is very much as a caricature, if you like. But for a, for a hundred pounds a megawatt hour for every every megawatt hour that we produce, hundred pounds, um, we have a certain a, a small amount that we pay the turbine manufacturers for operating the uh, operating the turbines for us. We have. Um, uh, breakdown or, or, or spare parts need to be put in place, they pay for them, we pay a fixed fee, and they pay, pay us if, if availability is low as a consequence. Um, the rent, <clears throat> as we sort of talked about on the, on the previous slide, we pay a certain fixed percentage of revenue, we pay for using the grid, we pay business rates as you can go down that stack. So what it says is the total operations and maintenance cost 25 is, is, is means that free cash flow is 75% of revenue. Um, you know, we can do lots of work on getting that uh, O&M cost down, and over the last 11 years, as the industry has matured, those costs have come down. But the most important thing really is um, revenue drivers of volume and price, so what we produce and what we get paid for that. Um, all pretty straightforward, hopefully. So if you carry on down to those two revenue drivers, these are hopefully sort of quite important. Um, on the left-hand side, we have um, production. Uh, and on the right hand side, we have what we get paid for each of those megawatt hours that we produce. So on, on the left hand side, you've got production. So production has obviously got two key components. You've got the um, wind speed, and then you've got the ability of, of, of a particular wind farm to produce uh, power from that wind speed. So if you buy a wind farm that's uh, a year old, you'll have been taking that data, data will have been recorded for every every ten minutes uh, in that year, uh, and so. Uh, you have over 50,000 data points, um, and what that what that does is effectively it calibrates the wind farm to, um, uh, to, to to effectively to you know what what it will produce in 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 particular wind speeds. So it calibrates the wind speed. So the wind speed is variable; um, it, it varies a lot day to day, not so much week to week, and not very much over a year, and definitely not much over 25 years. And so <clears throat> we we um, do that calibration, the 50,000 data points. Um, what it actually does is it calibrates to maybe a local airport or, or, or where, where, where data has been taken for the last 50 years. And so actually it, it's like having a 50-year a production. Um, and, and so actually the, the left-hand side is as much about diligence and making sure you get that calibration right before you bought it, doing the analysis, um, and then taking um, uh, you know, some intra-year um, volatility and wind speed, if you like. So it's mostly about diligence, production, not not really about risk. 
and come onto the right hand side. Um, so for the vast majority of the projects that we have, we have what's called we, we, we get what's called a renewable obligation certificate. That is a an RPI linked certificate that is of value in the hands of a utility. So when we produce a mega tower of, of renewable power, that certificate we sell to the utility um, on a fixed price. They need it to give it to the, the regulator off gem uh, to avoid being fined. That's how the system works. And that certificate started off at £30 in 2002. It's now over £60. Pounds. This is uh, 20, 23's number. Uh, it increases is over £60. Pounds. Um, that's RPI linked. And that, that is it's sort of a key thing for us, I guess, is it, it gives us a lot of stability. Obviously, the left hand side, the production is stable, the certificate is stable, and RPI linked. And it gives us a you know a great exposure, a, a great ability to take the um, the, the, the wholesale pass, uh, power price on top of that. So we sell power into the market generally on a day ahead basis, um, and 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 so <clears throat> you know prices will go up and down depending on, on what's happening in power prices. But actually, what you can see even on that is that um, given we have a lot of dividend cover, we can take quite a low power price for for quite a while, still pay a dividend that increases with RPI, but then have you know the, the the exposure if if power prices are a lot higher we get we get paid for that so it's an asymmetric risk if you like so carrying on through this this is a bit sort of uh, messy if you like but I'm sure the, the slides will be uh, uh, with you after the presentation if you want but you see very steady production you see cash generation um, you can probably actually even see in here the high cash generation in 2022 5601 that's predominantly in the war in Ukraine and the high the, the high uh, power prices that we had to prices were high then and that obviously translates to the dividend cover the fifth column of 3.2 times in 2022 uh, you will be able to see uh, the dividend line uh, always increasing you could do this mathematically by 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 the rpi line um and then you can sort of see um, for last year we paid in 2023 a special dividend of 1.24 pence so we took it up to 10p um, because we wanted to share some of that excess cash generation with with, with shareholders and then we increased, excuse me, <clears throat> we increased the dividend by um, by RPI uh, for um, for this year coming. You see the 14.2%, 14 14 which is more than the 5.2% of RPI in 2023. Uh, if you did the comparison between RPI and dividend growth, you can sort of see that one for one, it's, it's RPI has increased one year. You know, the dividend goes up the next, RPI increased again, dividend growth. You can see the sort of translation through that. And you can sort of see the NAV growth through that uh, as well. Um, but 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 on, on the dividend cover line, I guess you can see the stability of this business. So it's been you know up and down. It's averaged about 1.7. That's the design of the business. The last three years, it's been higher than that. Um, we've been paid uh, uh, well uh, for each mega tower that we've produced. But even though production has been sort of slightly down over those three years, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. You know, average dividend cover two times, um, and you can sort of see the the stability of the cash flows in this business. Um, very quickly, this is this sort of shows how how net asset value has grown um, uh, ahead of, of RPI. Uh, you can see the sort of the, the, the end part of those uh, the big increases. That's with high high power prices that come through. Um, but other than just paying a dividend with it, it increases with RPI, which is obviously hugely and a high dividend as well at 10p, which is hugely good for um, uh, you know uh, for, for ISA. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, for ISAs, we've also got um, good uh, capital preservation. I think one of the most important things for us when we were thinking about listing this business back in 2011, we successfully did it in 2013, is that this is not many years after the credit crunch and those issues of high income RPI linkage when obviously after the credit crunch government wasn't setting interest rates to try and tackle inflation. They were quite happy with inflation. So having inflation in our um, uh, in, in our DNA or inflation protection is, is obviously extremely helpful. Um, but also, obviously, people were concerned about the capital preservation um, after the credit crunch. So I think that for us is a product of a dividend, always increasing with RPI, always growing now on a real basis, um, obviously hugely uh, important then and now. So carrying on through, these are sort of a few themes here. Um, you would have to uh, look to some extent with a magnifying glass to see some of this, but if you got to mid um, 2016 and the Brexit vote, you can actually see the TSR on our line. It's obviously covered slightly by the grey line, um, increasing quite significantly after the, the the Brexit vote. And what that says, I guess, is um, people spotting that the this business is in, effectively inflation protected and where 
Brexit was was inflationary for, for a number of reasons, um, mostly to do with devaluation of sterling. That was beneficial to us, and our, our, our total shale return went up as a consequence. I think you can see then, as, as you get through towards 2018, 2019, that the whole sort of green effect, if you like, um, this is an ESG stock um, it, par excellence, if you like, um, but you know, hugely, uh, uh, hugely helpful in one sense um, going through 2018, 2019 as, as investors started to you know, want that as a theme in, the, in, their, in their portfolios. Um, we were pretty resilient with the first sort of two weeks of, of COVID. Uh, you can sort of see the spike down there, um, came back up pretty quickly, not much to do with us. I think we got caught really with the passive nature of the FTSE 250 and ETFs. Uh, be, we were becoming overweight as everyone else really were affected by the by the by the pandemic. We really weren't. Um, so recovery pretty quickly, and then power prices off the you know towards the back end of this, um, you can sort of see the benefits of those coming through in terms of stock uh, stock price performance. So those three themes of of, of inflation, ESG, um, power price exposure, um, you know, hugely beneficial to us, and you can sort of see this see the three themes there, and then the, the indices that you may want to. Basis against we've outperformed them pretty pretty comprehensively. Power price is obviously a key theme, um, and, uh, and the return is the other one which I want to talk on, on the next slide about. But power prices here, I think what what, what we do is we put the uh, the central case for an independent consultant into our into our model. We disclose a lot of what we uh, put into our model um, in uh, uh, in our own accounts. So you can see that in great detail. The numbers, not just the chart. Um, we have. Uh, a couple of things actually, you know, take the central case and that's what that is. Um, you also have on top of that, um, wind doesn't get the average power price because uh, how power prices are set in the UK is, is is by something called the merit order and the merit order works um, such that if you have more wind on the system, you push the, um, uh, the, the, the person that sets the, the price for the whole market to be uh, a cheaper um, combined gas, uh, combined cycle of gas turbine uh, site. Um, if you have less wind volume, you drag the more expensive one down. So it means that we don't get access to the average power price. Last year, we were <clears throat> our, our, what's called our capture discount, which is that effect. The wind doesn't get get all of, all of the capture. All of the average price was was six percent. We model ten to twenty percent. So we're hopefully fairly conservative on on that basis. Um, and then the, the bottom chart hopefully shows you actually that, that our base case, well, it, whatever it might be, uh, two times covered, um, that, that actually it, it's pretty robust for the downside. And obviously, we're trying to make sure, first of all, we protect the downside, but we still have this asymmetric risk um, <clears throat> uh, on, on the upside, as you, as you can sort of see there. Um, if, if you're wondering how power prices are set, just out of interest, and, and how could you ever get down there? So power prices are generally set with um, if you burn gas, you have to you have to pay for carbon. Carbon is generally about twenty pounds a megawatt hour. Out of that stack, you've then got uh, gas on top of that, which at the moment is quite cheap. So that's probably another twenty five pounds on top of that. Then you've got um, um, transmission costs that a gas gas fired gas fired power station would have to use. So it's pretty hard to see how you get below forty five pounds a megawatt hour. Um, and actually, uh, in the base case, obviously quite a lot higher than that um, with with forecast. But that's how that gets built up. Um, return is the other point I wanted to talk about. So we have um, we we, are, we we do believe in what you know what people refer to as the capital asset pricing model. We do think that that's imp important. And so our return at um, is not unrelated to what what we think is the most relevant gilt ten year gilt. So we we look at that and, and are consistent with that. Um, and so over the last eleven years, as as those gilt rates have come down, we have uh, we did reduce our return down a little bit. But actually, as it's gone up, we've put that back up again because we think that's relevant. So on now of our 11% um, portfolio IRR with with 0.9 of, of fees takes us to about 10% return to investors. That versus a gilt rate, which is a just a just mentioned below 4%, shows that we are um, trading at about 6%. Well, we're not trading, so the NAV is about 6% return higher than the gilt rate for a business that isn't volatile, as hopefully we've just shown. Um, if you if you take that return to the actual share price at the moment, that's probably more like 12 versus the long term get rid of four. So that's a very good risk return. The fact that we're not trading there at the moment, we think, is probably more to the fact that when, since we listed, and remember we were the first of companies doing this, we've had a whole lot of uh, companies follow follow on from us who aren't as big um, and therefore not as liquid, um, don't have as high enough ret as high return as this. Um, and 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 as a consequence, um, 
you know probably are and then and then as you get sort of further on to um you know, 18 19 20 you get battery storage and and uh, which arguably shouldn't be done under, under a similar sort of model um and and also you have uh, digital uh, dg9 which i think voted to 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 uh, to wind down recently probably for good reason so i think what you see on that um, it's companies that really invested on the back of yield. Remember, ours is about yield and reinvestment, i.e. return. So our return is high enough. Um, some of those companies need to come out of the sector. The fact that we're nearly in the FTSE 100 means that we have, we're the biggest company in the sector by quite a long way. Um, we provide liquidity to the sector. So actually, our return probably is sufficiently high. But because of issues of cost disclosure, multi-asset redemptions, um, you know, short-term guilt buying, and, and some and too many companies in the wider sector. Um, we, 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 we probably, that's probably the reason why our share price is down. It's about market. It's not really about value. So arguably, now is a good time to to buy, uh, in our opinion, uh, as we have been doing personally um, and, and holding for the longer term. Secondary market, you can sort of see this. This is as a build out of uh, you know, onshore wind, a little bit more of that going forward. Um, and, and actually going from here to 2030, probably pro probably quite a lot more, mostly in Scotland, um, given given wind volumes and and, and land, uh, and then then the offshore build increasing significantly, uh, and and we can sort of see that a sort of tripling of that is 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 something that we we, we will see from both political parties. So this isn't a, a this isn't partisan. This is a political support across the across the political spectrum, uh, which wasn't necessarily the case back when we listed in 2013. Not even in 2015, 16, when when uh, the Tories got in rather unexpectedly by themselves, but definitely the case now. So you know, there's a big, a big secondary market. Um, we we are seven percent of a hundred billion pound market that should increase to two hundred billion pounds over the next ten years. Um, if we stayed at seven percent and um, you know bought operating assets as as, as utilities, recycled capital, and, and built that uh, new capacity out. Um, we would be about 50 or 60 in the FTSE. Uh, you know, I'm not saying we will do that, and that's not even a strategy, but just gives you a sort of a size of a market, uh, positioning the market and the size. The benefit of being as big as we are in that in this market is that we generally are now only doing bilateral transactions um, and not and not competing with anyone else. Uh, you can sort of see this here, uh, where we're not far from from the end here. Um, we did. Uh, we have done about half of our assets with uh, bilaterally. All four of those on the right side were bilateral. Two of them we committed to do in 2020, and they were built out. And as soon as they came to completion, we we we, we bought them um, as we were committed to do. And then two others, Al Candy and, and London Array. If if you've ever flown out of uh, um, Heathrow, you're probably going over the top of London Array on the uh, on the top of Kent coast. Uh, as an example, Al Candy is just south of Glasgow, as as our South Carl and Kitemuir extension. Um, to the west of the uh, M74, um, but but all of those are <clears throat> they were done bilaterally um, uh, uh, with with uh, because of the size and the, and the capability for stability transactions. Um, the theme obviously for this year buybacks obviously quite important um, for people. You know what should we be doing when the shares are, sh shares are trading um, below net asset value for whatever reason? Well, you know we have a billion pounds of excess cash flow over the next five years. What do we do with that? Um, first of all, we did increase the dividend on, on a one-off basis, a, a, a 1.24p uh, increase for last year, uh, especially if you like. Um, we then increased more than RPI, so we're giving more of the dividend back to shareholders. Um, we are uh, buying, buying back shares at the moment because if, if the shares are trading in the 15% discount, that's a good thing for us to do. So we're about a quarter of the way through a £100 million pound buyback programme. Um, we would look to do some disposals. Um, uh, if we were going to continue doing acquisitions, because I think the important thing is that we we think we can syndicate some of our assets at, uh, at, at net asset value, but also then buy back given the market and the bilateral position that we have and the strength of the, of, of, of our buying, if you like, um, we, we, should, we, we could do that at, at, at a discount to NAV. So you can see that capital of disposals at NAV and buying, back at disc uh, buying assets rather than discount is, is, is a valuable thing to do. And ultimately, um, every, every month we can repay we, we can repay a revolving credit facility and re, repay down debt. So that just gives us a lot of flexibility with that huge cash flow that we have um, to do all of those things, and we'll we'll decide to do those in in in, in the, the the scale that is irrelevant to the time. Um, nearly at the end, so ESG obviously quite an important thing for us. 
um, we have, have long had to get over um, not just saying to investors we're a wind farm business and what's not to like about that. Um, so all of the reporting and the and the uh, TCFD, um, some of which skipped through, especially I think we see we we feel is pretty meaningless, but we have to do anyway. Um, all of the uh, annexes one, three, and five, uh, three on the web sort of thing, uh, and, and uh, you can sort of see all of that. Um, the corporate rating is the thing that we'll sort of end up doing quite a little, little bit more of, I think, uh, as as time goes by, and then you can sort of see the SDGs at the back end that we naturally do, as uh, given what we do. Um, as a disclaimer, so I won't go through that. Um, Alan, I think I've managed to get in with half an hour, but uh, over to you. Excellent work. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I know you're very keen to talk about politics and there are a number of questions about that. But before we do, <laughs> before we do that, um, there's a couple of operational questions. Um, I'm just going to put a nice picture on the front, if anyone's with me, rather than a disclaimer. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, good. Um, In fact, that's about do you want to talk a bit about um, life cycle yeah. of of assets? You know, decommissioning. Obviously, older older wind turbines are less efficient than new, and had, you know, recycling and and all of that stuff. And then yeah. there's another question you mentioned briefly: um, battery energy storage. Yeah, and uh, one of the questions is around, and you know, there there is a, a kind of move to co-locate batteries um, with with generating assets, isn't there? Is that something that you see for for UK wind? So you so should I do? I'll do batteries afterwards, but should I do? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, recycling and age. So turbines are made of um, all sorts of. Uh, uh, component parts. So actually, if they fail, you just replace the component parts. The only thing that's sort of life limiting is is the uh, uh, foundations and tower. Effectively, uh, if they fail, and then obviously the turbine goes through a number of, of, of fatigue cycles in its uh, thirty years of life. Um, we assume that they last thirty years. We have technical sign off for thirty five years plus, but we think that they will last an awful lot longer. Um, and that's just about you know how, how much does something get pushed. All of the components you can change, so you can change the gearboxes every ten years, probably fine. You know, they cost about a quarter of a million pounds each. We have those in our numbers, and actually, what we've found over the last ten, eleven years is that we've probably over budgeted for um, uh, for spares. Uh, performance doesn't particularly degrade over time. Not quite. So, cellar farms do slightly because they, they, they the the uh, the PV uh, cells degrade slightly. That isn't really true with with wind. You just replace the parts. Panel, you need to you just need to replace the whole panel with the with the turbine. You replace the you know, component parts of it. Um, so so we 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 don't see significant issues with with you know long term production. Uh, mostly offshore, for instance, we have it's more about logistics management. We do better. We know how to industry knows how to manage offshore better um, than it did twenty years ago, ten years ago, five years ago, and and so performance is better because we know how to how, how to get people offshore easily and and and, and or, Condition monitor, put kit on uh, equipment to, to to know when it's going to be, fail before it's going to fail, etc. So we do all of that. Um, the only thing that really needs recycling is is uh, blades, and we we've been spending work on we, we've got two schemes with Edinburgh University and Imperial to to do uh, work on you know what do you do with uh, blades and how do you recycle them? Do you chemically do it? Do you grind them down? Blah blah blah. All all sorts of things. We have two university. PhD projects working on that um, a quarter million pounds. We're doing that. Um, so those are really the bits. You, the only bits you can't really recycle. Um, in terms of batteries, uh, we generally sell power. Um, we enter into long-term contracts to sell power on the day-ahead basis. So we wouldn't generally co-locate for practical reasons because it's really someone else's point. You know, we sell it whatever the day-ahead price is. If did you know defined from eleven o'clock today for tomorrow and eleven o'clock yesterday for today, that's the price that we get. So whether it goes into a battery and someone else does that, really it's someone else's issue. So that's the practical reasons why we wouldn't do it. Um, we think there's probably a decent argument that um, batteries are better. That they're, they're useful for doing what are called sort of ancillary services, so mod modulating frequency or modulating uh, current uh, and and uh, Doing sort of reactive power and stuff like that, most of which we can do in the turbine anyway. 
Uh, but batteries are useful for that. Whether they're really useful for arbitraging power prices, debatable. Um, and, and the long, I think that the, you know, the sort of the, the 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 DCF model of batteries, I think, has been shown over the last two three months to not be particularly sensible. So the battery companies, I think, probably shouldn't be done on DCF. They should be done on a EBITDA basis and just owned differently. I think that's part of the problem of a return slide I sort of showed you. Um, they should, that isn't really kind of the right business. Um, whether co-location is is something that is interesting to do, actually the right thing is a different question. In the long term, lithium batteries all around the country probably isn't the right answer. Um, the long term to get more renewable generation on the system is to get hydrogen to work, uh, and that's probably 10 years away. But that's the real focus, because you can do that in great volume, so that whenever there's big wind volume, which is by far the biggest, produce and always will be of renewable power, you have demand, you have the ability to electrolyze hydrogen and, and, and put it into form that you could put back back to um, power stations when, when when you need it. Yeah, and it has the benefit of working with relatively straightforward engineering if you can generate yeah. the, the hydrogen, doesn't it? So. Yeah, I mean, hydrogen is, is going to be located in the short term, at least, as we're doing a little bit inside through the green code, next next to usage in the short in the short term, at least, because I think transport is more difficult. But if you can produce hydrogen um, uh, uh, where it then gets used by industry, that's quite helpful. So co-location co -location of that is probably good as well, but anyway, that's going into a bit too much detail, perhaps. But, but overall, UK wind is selling power a day ahead and those are your long-term contracts yeah, so that's right. it's your yeah you're, you're sticking to your your business model right uh, um the it, we will get to government and regulation um but there's that there, there is a couple of questions about this off gem thing that um there's like a is it constraint payments oh yeah um that was yeah Nothing to do with UK. I'll tell you about both parts of that. So, um, can you see my arrow on the on the chart? On the on the chart? Is that you? Can you see that? Uh, can you see that? No. Okay, fine. Okay. So you know where Inverness is, the cluster, you know, the different one. As long as you know the map. Yeah. So if you go up towards the uh, uh, top of the Scotland, and you see we've got six uh, wind farms there. Mm. Um, those wind farms occasionally are turned off on the basis that you can't get the power down. Um, to the south of England, where the population is, or even to the Central Belt easily, um, and and therefore they get paid for being turned off, uh, and that's because arguably there's too much capacity on the hills, but or there's too little transmission capability. That will change over over time, um, and then the problem is uh, there's, there's two two sort of components to it. Is that that um, how how do you work out what you would have? How do you bid? How would you work out what you would have? Produced if you continue to stay on, and and the sort of simple answer to that is is you know you need to you need to estimate a volume and you need to you need to put a price and you're not allowed to unduly profit because we're not trying to you, we would prefer to be paid we prefer to, but for producing but because there's too much capacity on the hillside or more importantly too little transmission which isn't our fault um then we we do get uh, it tend to be paid off so the off gem is the the, the, the stuff that's been in the press is about the, the volume but also the price now in terms of the we'll come back to the volume in a minute the price is has been interesting because there was uh, how we set the price effectively is to work out so if we've been turned on we would have it would have been this but the fact that we have been turned off means that we have a, and we're allowed to do this a little bit of wear and tear because off and on is not so good it's better to be on all the time um, uh, or, or if when you turn off, you need to take a little bit of time to warm the warm turbines up again a little bit, and they don't necessarily come on straight away. So there's some potential loss there. So you build you build up the amount you can, that, that you can bid, um, and 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 so you put a price into the market when you bid, and to the extent that you are um, you're the you're the first one, you know the cheapest, you'll be turned off. Now the, the perversity of that, if you like, is that if you're turned off a lot, people will say. Oh, that's not great. You know, you're making profit from not doing anything. Well, we would prefer to be on. So, so actually, do you then, as a consequence, put the price up a little bit because you want to not be turned off so much because you don't want to be subject to that criticism? Um, and then, well, your price is too high. <laughs> so I think it's a bit, it's a bit of a difficult one. So we try and set a price that isn't, you know, is, is uh, means that we're not turned off too much um, 
uh, and, and, and I think we've done that really well over the last uh, five or six years. The particular problem that came to Ofgem was that something uh, called Doronel GDF run is on a is 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 on a spur where there's there's some conventional power on it, and I think that the difficulty with that is that it's very hard to get a price signal. So whether EDF had got it, whether they behaved badly or they just got it wrong, that's about that. We're, we're not in, in any of those circumstances. Um, and, and so what we bid is, is pretty sort of standard and, and uh, uh, not profiteering. And so the price per megawatt, not, not an issue for us. The other thing there was then that the Bloomberg then um, thought, that, thought that they had found was that people were uh, deciding that today, you know, if I'm going to be turned off tomorrow because it's going to be very windy, the volume that I'm going to put through is, and they just exaggerate how much they would have produced. Um, I, I think that, first of all, Bloomberg probably doesn't have access to data, so it doesn't really know what it's asking. That's probably one thing, but we have since um, gone back and done an analysis of each of our sites and actually worked out that we have probably bid, because you can do a sort of comparison of what you bid versus what the the, the, the anemometer on site actually would have produced, so you can actually do the calibration. Um, and I think we've we've worked out that we um, estimated um, lower volume than, than we actually would have produced. So it's the wrong way around for us. You know, we've been underpaid. Um, so I think that uh, um, it, it's a bit complicated, and there's a lot of headlines that don't really make much sense. And I don't think anyone is trying to profit from this. They're just trying to run a system where there's not not, not sufficient uh, transmission. Um, but we're definitely we're definitely not uh, you know we run our business professionally and, and definitely not guilty of anything there. Good, thanks. It's good to it's good to get that on on, yeah. on records. So so let's get to the there's a, there's a number of questions um, and I'd kind of summarise it as um, likely change of government. Yeah. Um, seeming stop start policy um the auction the 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 offshore wind oh, auction yeah. yeah um and i'm going to throw this into the mix it may be beyond your remit stephen but it's an interesting question um about security um underwater yeah. cables um foreign governments yeah submarines what's the resilience of the of the network to something like that <clears throat> yeah so there's a whole bunch of questions yeah, there yeah, but i think you can sort yeah, of yeah, categorize yeah. them under under policy and security yeah, exactly so you can, you can certainly go and fix offshore cables um it's not that hard to, to work out how to do as well and how you fix an offshore cable i mean most most offshore cables don't actually fail underwater they fail where you, where the where the um, <clears throat> where the cable comes onto site because uh, on, onto land rather and, and and hit because effectively what you've got there is you've got a slight change in metal and, and you form a little battery that can have all sorts of and, and, and also you have uh, so you have you know chemical reaction etc as you will all know and degradation it's really where the jointing is the most important thing um you also out of interest have either left or right-handed fleming uh, rules so you, you induce current and it can get quite hot at that joint um but Taking aside, you weren't asking about technical failures of, of wires. You were talking about terrorist failures of wires. Um, what what you do to find out whether where the, where the failure is 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 you, is you effectively put a current down it, and, and you sort of you, know, you, you sort of shunt current down a cable, and it bounces back. And how quickly it bounces back, you you know precisely how how far it is down the cable. Um, so, so actually, the <clears throat> you will know pretty precisely where the cable would have failed. Uh, by by being by, by, by being able to pulse electricity down the cable, um, and then you lift it up and you'd, uh, you'd you'd fix it. That's pretty sort of straightforward. Um, so you, it would take a day or two to sort of fix. But actually, the uh, uh, most most uh, most um, offshore sites have uh, multiple cables coming on shore, uh, and so in the in the short term, what you do um, if they, if they kept one cable is you reconfigure the turbines to send out by the other two or three cables, um, and all that means is you is, is you will do what's you'll have what's called peak shaving going on. So instead of having maximum capacity, you might have ninety percent capacity, um, but it's not linear room because you're not always you very seldom be above ninety percent. So you just take the peak off, so you don't actually lose very much by doing that. And you can run like that for quite a long time. Um, so offshore cabling, unless the, <clears throat> unless they went and did multiple cables, 
it's not going to cause you too much problems and, and you can fix them. Um, in terms of offshore uh, auctions, um, we have we had absolutely no surprise whatsoever that, uh, that, 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 that people didn't bid in the summer. It was obvious with two reasons. Um, the first being less important, but you know, as, as you get more build out, it's hardly surprising that the, the demand for turbines means the price should go up. So I think you're going to, you, and, and there's a lot, lot of uh, uh, demand for turbines going forward. So that that doesn't surprise us at all, even if, even if just for that reason. More importantly, with with interest rates going up, cost of capital has gone up. So no one could possibly uh, bid in the in the in the in, in the uh, um, in the window that the government gave, or uh, below the below the uh, the cap that the, the government gave. So I think it's blatantly obvious in the summer it was going to fail. Um, even before, and you could sort of see um, Horn C3, Orsted was saying, not sure we can build that at that price, and, and uh, Vattenfall pulled out of, of, of a project just off the north north coast called Boreas uh, because they couldn't do it under the price that had been agreed. So it's blatantly obvious it was, going to, it was a slow motion car crash. The, the question then is, did the government know it was going to happen, or did the government not know it was going to happen? We think that the government probably did know it was going to happen because they're not stupid. And, and 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 actually, the, the the reason why they did that is that it was much easier for them to let the market tell them the answer, rather than them in a cost of living crisis, just give these fat cats, um, uh, you know, Orsted and SSC and whomever, um, you know, you know, more return. So so I think I think for us it was it was hardly surprising, and it's just a it's a good thing the system's reset and and let's move on. In terms of government, uh, we think you know going back. Back in the day, uh, remember we listed with Vince Cable uh, as as business secretary. Uh, government put fifty million pounds into our IPO on the basis of getting a getting the sort of secondary market operating was a good thing for them to be investing in. They sold their stock at a profit a couple of years later, um, and and this, the rest is history. A lot, you know, there's there's tens of billions of pounds of, of money's come into the sector, not just in the listed funds, but also in the a lot more private uh, pension funds coming in, in in big scale alongside us or, or by themselves even and foreign investors private money etc so it's been a, you know a big success story and that's why Vince Cable did um, put 50 pounds into our IPO um, but then I think you know all the way through Labour's especially but but even Conservatives getting into 2015 um, you know it's become you know very much more mainstream so we don't think there's any we're absolutely agnostic between the political parties um, I've met uh, Jonathan Reynolds, the Shadow Business Secretary, very sensible, um, understands that markets need to operate properly. Um, I took Keir Starmer around Bishop Thorpe, one of our um, wind farms in Lincolnshire, about a year and a half ago, seemed pretty sensible. Uh, I think that they know that this is a sector that needs to operate. Keir Starmer actually said that back in what was 20, when was it? It was about. Um, it was about October 22, maybe. That that maybe it was it was sometime around about then anyway. But he said that it was quite important um, for them before getting into power to have got a lot of their thinking done, because if they didn't get into power until the back end of 24, uh, they would never be able to meet their 2030 targets. So I think that the Labour Party and and I think this was before their 28 billion pounds a year. To, to be coming back to nothing. So I think there's a lot of political will in it in the Labour Party to uh, get this to operate properly. And I think that you know working alongside companies like us, uh, you know they, they need all the, they need all the capital they can get. You know with their with their with their, their new green investment bank of sorts. So GB GB Energy is it? Um, you know that's a that's a that's a good source of capital. But it'll be it'll be working alongside people like us. Um, uh, so I think I think either either we're 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 absolutely okay with either and have conversations with 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 all. Yeah, yeah, that's that's reassuring to hear. As you do, <laughs> if you um, if you doom scroll through uh, news feeds, it's very easy to get 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 disheartened by uh, by certain stories, isn't it? But the underlying the underlying yeah, trend is pretty clear. Yeah, I was I was in a meeting with with other. CEOs last year with with you know people you'd recognise from SSC from Grax from Chris Trey from Centricare and uh, you know and and actually with the Chancellor and 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 actually getting capital into the sector through the utilities or or, or businesses like ours really really important you know we're not an important to government either either side uh, and and uh, um, 
they're actually the ability for us to bring capital in either through you know utility balance sheets or through through businesses like green code um government listens and has us in the room in those conversations yeah yeah there's a, there there are a few questions um around things like sensitivities um on interest rates and yeah and and i mean you might maybe you just want to talk very briefly about that but i would just say to the to the viewers that um uk wind does publish um quite regularly a very good analysis of its yeah. sensitivities which you can refer to and 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 um yeah, the slides from this presentation will be available to download so so Stephen, i don't i don't think we need to kind of go through it line by line but maybe you just want to talk about your yeah I mean, your key sensitivities well, yeah so i think that the the most important thing for us is <clears throat> you know inflation is pretty much of a pass through so if inflation is up or down you know it, it's it's not the end of there in some ways because the revenues are almost all linked to either explicitly through the rock or implicitly through the power price um and then all of the uh, vast majority of the costs are, are linked to, to inflation as well um <clears throat> so actually for us inflation is the point um and then in terms of in terms of interest rates we uh you know our return is uh, um you know we, we've set discount rates such that the return is 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 uh, you know moves has moved up and down with long-term rates i think it's quite important that um and we trade very wide of the <clears throat> of, of the 10-year guild um, so for us, you know, you know, interest rates are, are very important, but we've already, in one sense, got our defence in already um, by by having a you know a high uh, high return on the business and and uh, one that's that's way more than we think the the volatility of our cash flows would ever suggest. Um, we we don't think the wider sector has done that, and that's one of the reasons for because I think ultimately people have over the last ten years have listed on the back of yield and not really thought about return, and then with interest rates rising. Um, you know, the, the tide's gone out and they haven't got swimming tracks on. There's a little bit of that gone on. Um, and therefore, we think, you know, the wider infrastructure sector may need to um, tidy some stuff up. Uh, and then there may need to be some consolidation across the sector. We will continue, um, you know, to, to operate believing in the capital asset pricing model, you know, pricing up the long, long term gilt rates effectively in terms of return. Uh, and, and continue in a very big market to, to do precisely what we've always done. But we think there will be a smaller number of firms in a, in, a, in a year's time than there are at the moment, and there will be some consolidation. We, we can't do it because with the purity of our story, but also um, we don't necessarily accept that asset values and returns are accurate, so we could never offer enough. Even if we wanted to do a consolidation, we could never offer enough. Um, for, for, for anyone else's companies, and also with a market that's doubling over the next ten years, why would we do anything other than buy assets in the market? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to finish on the um, big picture question. Um, do you think how optimistic are you about net zero by 2050 and beyond? <laughs> Yeah, golly, it's a question. Um, <clears throat> optimistic. It's an, it's, it's an interesting question, I think, because in, in one sense, it's a bit of a bit of a meaningless question because I think that uh, you know <clears throat> UK might be net zero because it because it subcontracts, and this is a very this is existential. This isn't anything about our business. Yeah. Um, UK subcontracts a lot of its it, it, its consumption carbon, if you like, uh, abroad. So. You know, is that really us being net zero just because we've got someone else to do it? Um, so I, I, I think it's a bit of an odd, in, in one sense, it's a bit of an odd question, Alan, because I don't think we are going to be net zero, even if we can account to be net zero. Mm. Uh, I, you know, <clears throat> do I think that society, but well, society, societal changes about, you know, eating, you know, less, less, um, less red meat or not getting in airplanes or having fewer children? You know that, that that's more the question about whether than whether we can decarbonize the power grid, and, and those are those are questions that everyone might have answers for. We can do our bit in terms of power generation, yeah. but the, the rest is <clears throat> how does society want to tackle this, and that's political yeah. and yeah. I, I knew that was I knew that was a bit 
bit of a slightly unfair question because <laughs> you have your you can answer that as well as me Alan. yes well indeed the answer, really. well i haven't been on a flight for five years so i mean not no and i think no. that's, that's an interesting thought isn't it mm. i don't fly I, I, if i ever get to edinburgh i get on the train um for a whole range of reasons not least because it's easier to work but, but also actually it, it's a better thing to do so i think that you know there's a yeah. fair bit of that you do have yeah. to yeah it is more than just as you say, it's more than it's more than just decarbonising the grid. Yeah, to get net zero, isn't it? So good, Stephen. That's that was um, that was really interesting. Thanks, thanks for taking the time and for and for no, no, designing no. designing such a such a pertinent presentation for for our viewers as well. Um, there's a lot of good questions. Actually, I said at the beginning that. Um, there's a lot of jargon. It seems like quite a few of our viewers um, are very familiar with the jargon. But um, <laughs> thanks, like it. <laughs> thanks for not thanks for not using too much of it. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Cheers.